We only have 13 minutes left and probably so many questions. Um, there's one question at the back that I'll take. Where were you when on the bailout? Were you over Normandy? No, you were in Northern England, right? Answer that one shortly. That's a very interesting question. We bailed out in Cumbria. So Cumbria is t attached to the northern boundary of uh, Yorkshire and also Northumberland is, is also Touched to the boundary of Cumbria, and uh, when we had to, when the food was getting low, well, I got to go back. They they told us we'd have to go to Sillith, which is well over 100 miles away. That was on the Irish coast. I knew we'd never get there. Not enough fuel. But no, there wouldn't be near enough fuel. But. Uh, there's, a, there's another story I should tell you about. They say you can't fly by the sheet of your pants. Mm. And th there was only one, we were the only aircraft to come back that night. My wireless operator, well, uh, it's a long story because we were going to go on leave next day. We, we got 12 minutes. Yeah, and he had, his, he had his train ticket purchased. And about every 15 minutes, he called me up and wanted to know what the weather was like. Mm. I told him, I said, the weather's terrible. We've been flying in rain for about an hour. I said, why do you keep asking for the weather? I said, with no way we're going to land in, in this kind of weather. And when he got a diversion, he hesitated, and he said, no, he didn't have one. Well, we know why he didn't, because when we were doing our operational training, he found himself a new girlfriend. <laughs> anyway. When they told me to, the patrol officer was the only one on duty, he told me to climb to 35, no, he told me first of all, he said, I'll turn what lights on I have, see if you can see anything. Well, it was pouring rain and low cloud, I couldn't see anything. So he said, climb up to 3,500 feet and stand by. So to save fuel, I put on just enough RPMs to do a slow climbing turn, and it's easier to turn to port than it would be to starboard. So I had just enough power to do a slow climbing turn. But while I was doing that, I must have been slowly pulling back on the control column. All of a sudden, my navigator yelled at me, said, Skipper, what's happening? And just as he said that, some of his equipment ended up in the cockpit. Well, I knew immediately what had happened. While I was doing this slow climbing turn, the Halifax was almost on its back. Ooh. And I shoved the throttles forward and pushed the nose down, and I still recall that aircraft started to quiver. If it had been another two or three seconds, we'd have gone and upside down within a few seconds we'd have crashed so I said well the heck with this so I shoved the throttles forward and I climbed up to 5,000 feet mm -hmm. and then of course finally I knew that we weren't going to fly along as soon as I, wa I, I made sure that there wasn't, wasn't very much fuel left in because I knew there'd be an investigation but when we bailed out we bailed out in Cumbria, and if you've ever been over in England, Cumbria is what they call the Fells District. And some of those hills are about 3,500 feet high, mm -hmm. and they're quite steep. And uh, when we bailed out, it was still raining, and then it quit raining, and then it was foggy about, and we all have a battle dr uh, whistle on our battle dress. So it was real quiet, and I'm sitting on my parachute, and I heard a whistle, and I blew mine, and it was one of the gunners. Within about 15 minutes, the two gunners and myself had got together. The fog had, it was still foggy, but we were there. Then the fog cleared. So we got out our escape kits. We ate the chocolate in there. There's a little compass in there, so 
I remember the gunner said, well, what do we do now, Skipper? I said, well, we'll go back from the way we came. So we headed northeast and we walked all day and it was a real hot day and the heather and grass was right up to our knees and we had the new type of flying boots on, we're all fleece lined. And all we saw were sheep, hundreds and hundreds of sheep. <laughs> and about seven o'clock at night, my rear gunner said, Skipper, I think I can see a house. Oh, I said, you must be hallucinating, you can't be. No, he said, I think I can see a house. Well, we kept on walking and sure enough, there was a shepherd and his wife. That was what they called their summer home. Mm -hmm. And they were looking after about six or 700 sheep. And I remember they had three sheep dogs. And we couldn't understand Mr. Blinkensop, we found out was his name. His lingo was such, we couldn't understand it. We could understand his wife. <laughs> and they lived in a hut. I remember they'd had a, a dirt floor, but it had a, a hole across the, the ceiling and we could see all the bacon and hams hanging there and the chickens were running around in the yard. She said, I bet you lads are hungry. And I said, well, yeah, we really are. So she made us some bacon and eggs and in the meantime, he thought it was the hired man, but it turned out it was the son. And they had a, a cart there and a horse. So he told his son to I don't know where he told him to go, but anyway, about midnight, an RAF van showed up and uh, took us to Penrith, which was in the in the Pyrenees, uh, not the Pyrenees, uh, they have a ridge of mountains, they call them mountains, but they're really high hills. And there's a hospital there. When we got there, the rest of the crew were there. They'd been there for hours. So I don't know how, uh, we got separated from them. And anyway, that morning, uh, a Halifax came from uh, the station and took us all back to the airdrome. So that was an experience that uh, is still very vivid in my mind, especially when that Halifax was almost on his back. If I hadn't another two or three seconds, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So that's why. I found out you can't fly by the sheet of your pants. <laughs> a number of Reg's stories, as you can tell, are moments where he could have died, mm. but he didn't. He could have died, but he didn't. And it's, it's been um, quite remarkable to sit with this man and hear his stories. Um, he didn't think about his war history for most of his adult life. It was actually after his wife passed and he was um, many years after his wife passed, actually, in his 80s, when he started reflecting more on it. His home here in Saskatoon, <clears throat> excuse me, is lined with history books, war history books, and uh, he's, he's like a little walking encyclopedia, as you can tell, and you know how many thousands of this and hundreds of thousands of that. So it's, um, it's been quite an honor to record these stories that you've heard today and many more. I think we, we might have time for one more question. There's about five minutes left, but he's dying to tell you something. So let's just go one, let's go back here for one second. Okay, I just want to say. We're okay? Some things happen in your life that really, you probably all had instances in your life that changed the direction of your life. And in 1990, uh, in February the 6th, 1990, it was a bad year for me and my three daughters because my wife went to the bathroom at one o'clock in the morning and her heart stopped. Oh. So 1990 wasn't a very good year, but that same year there was a Allied Air Force reunion in Toronto. And all that summer I had a large yard and I was a member, of course, of the Air Force Association. And some little voice said, you know, maybe you should, maybe things will turn around for you. Maybe you should go to that Allied Air Force reunion. I'd be interested to see if there are any fellows that you meet there that you actually know. So at the very last minute, I went to that reunion. And it was started on a Thursday and finished on a Sunday. And on a Sunday brunch, we all picked up our plate and uh, 
I was looking for a place to sit down. And there were two other former airmen sitting there. Turned out that they were former high school principals and they'd gone to, they both ended up being school superintendents. So one of them said, well, if you're looking for a place to sit, sit down here. So I sat with them, they introduced themselves, I introduced myself. A fellow by the name of Don Gray, oh, he said, I see that you're a member of the Caterpillar Club. Tell me how that happened. Oh, and he said, you've also got the guinea pig wing. What happened there? So I told him. He said, is that all that happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, there's a couple more things happened. A couple, just a couple. So he said, well, tell me about them. So I told him. He said, did you ever think about writing a book? Oh, I said, no, I'm not a writer. I said, I wouldn't know what to write. He said, well, you know, he said, I'm retired now. He said, and I'm taking up writing. He said, I like to write. Would you mind if I wrote up your story? He said, do you have any records? I said, well, I do. After the Access to Information Act expired, which is enforced for 25 years, mm -hmm. I wrote to the War Records Branch in Ottawa. It took about six months before I heard from him, but one day in the mail, I got an envelope 26 inches long. I measured it, 26 inches long. 14 inches wide, an inch and a half thick. So you can imagine after, if there's a aircraft accident and an airman loses his life, it's mandatory that they have an investigation. So that they did two investigations into those aircraft and some of them took 35 or 40 pages. So. I sent all that information to Mr. Gray, and uh, he wrote an article, when a tour equals 19 trips, and he sent it to the uh, Air Force Association. This was 1990, towards the end of 1990. And they wrote back to him and said, well, we've got a lot of stories to publish. It might take a year, or maybe two, or maybe more, but that story, appeared in the Air Force magazine in their summer issue in 1993. And it wasn't long after that story, because those that magazine came out on all the newsstands across Canada. It wasn't very long before I started getting phone calls from journalists, from writers, from historians, and if I hadn't gone to that reunion, I would have disappeared at the woodwork like thousands of other airmen did. No one ever wrote about them. They would probably had a lot of heroic experiences, danger experiences. And I don't know if you're aware of it, but Saskatchewan government put out a book called Age Shall Not Weary Them. Mm and it contains the names of 4,500 veterans from Saskatchewan. Some of you here have probably seen that book. And almost every day, I put that book on a chair, and almost every day I see that book, and I realize just how fortunate I am to have returned from the war, and you think of all the thousands and thousands that never had the opportunity to do that. And I've been very active with the Legion, going to schools, both public and high schools. And my main reason for doing that, not to talk about my experiences, but to remind the school children how fortunate we are to live in a country like this, where we can have a government that we want and not be told we can demonstrate, get signs up, tell the government how much we don't like them and so on, without fear of any reprisals. And that's what I try to emphasize, that we live in a free country. And also, as you all know, in all the wars that Canada was involved in, we were thousands of miles away mm -hmm. from the actual battlefields. Yet, 
During those wars, there were one and a half million Canadians volunteered to go to fight so that Canada could remain a free country. And of that total, 118,000 never came back. So that's what I try to emphasize when I go to speak to the kids in school. Thank you. That's a beautiful, fitting way to end our presentation today. Um, we will be sitting at our table over there for a little bit, and we thank you again thank you. for your time and for your interest in Reg Cash Harrison's story. I just want to say to you all, it's been a, an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you. <laughs>